This is lecture 2B um, for September 2nd, 2020 for History 111. Uh, and the first one I talked about ancient Mesopotamia, and I'm going to talk about ancient Egypt. Um, Egypt is, uh, when I talk about Egypt, I'm not talking about the modern day country. I'm really talking about the Nile River Valley, which is a smaller part of that country. Um, Egypt was first settled permanently um, in about 5200 BCE. And Egypt did not invent agriculture, but agriculture was borrowed from um, uh, ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and we know that because basically the same crops that were in ancient Mesopotamia show up a thousand years later in ancient Egypt. And so, um, so Egyptians basically borrowed the idea of agriculture and they borrowed the seeds and the domesticated plants and, and, and animals from Mesopotamia. So agriculture was borrowed, but Egypt turned out to be an absolutely fantastic place for agriculture. I mean, the Nile River comes, flows straight north um, through Egypt and into the Mediterranean, and it floods very regularly every year, right? And, and this flood is, these floods are massive, but they bring enormous amounts of silt from, from up in the highlands in Sudan down into Egypt. Um, and so Egypt is fantastically fertile because this silt is fantastic uh, topsoil. And so Egypt gets this enormous amount of water and then it has this load of new topsoil every year. And so Egypt is one of the most productive and fertile places on earth throughout the ancient world. Um, and it, very quickly, uh, Egyptians figured out not only how to do a good job of predicting when the flooding would happen exactly, but also to figure out how to manage it. Just like ancient Mesopotamia, they started to build an enormous system of, of canals and dikes and, and uh, reservoirs to capture as much of the water as possible and then release it slowly over the course of the growing season so that they could grow lots of food. Um, and, and Egypt is just the breadbasket of the Mediterranean uh, throughout the ancient world because of that. Now, one of the things, the results of that is that Egyptian society is way less, uh, well, the religion at least, is way less harsh than Mesopotamian society, in part because Mesopotamian society was really living in a pretty harsh environment and they actually managed to destroy that environment. So life kind of was precarious in, the, in Mesopotamia, but Egypt had this fantastic system that produced more you know, food all, uh, over and over again. And so Egyptian society sort of had a more optimistic outlook. All right? Now, very similar to Mesopotamia, Egyptian society had developed social classes uh, with, a, with an elite who owned significant chunks of land, with a government that was run by those elites, priests and soldiers, um, with, a, with a bureaucracy of, of scribes and scholars who served those elites, um, had a centralized government with a, with a, a, um, a pharaoh who was the king of, of Egypt. Um, and, and the, the government's job was to manage irrigation. And this is an important point because both in Mesopotamia and in Egypt, you saw governments become stronger because they're managing irrigation systems. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a later uh, discussion. Um, but the one place that Egypt was different is that Egypt had a fair amount of social mobility. It was possible for talented commoners to rise up to become members of the elite. In fact, if, you've, if you uh, have any knowledge of the Hebrew Bible, you know, Joseph, um, he of the coat of many colors, uh, becomes, you know, it goes from being a slave in Egypt all the way up to being advisor to the Pharaoh, all right, and very wealthy, etc. Um, but one of the interesting things about Egyptian society is its religion. It's much more optimistic. First of all, the Egyptian society really focused on this sort of cycle of life and death, right, that, that um, the, the, the rhythm of the seasons, the flooding and the growing in Egypt sort of gave this optimistic sense of, of life, death, and rebirth. Um, now, you know, obviously everywhere has seasons, but Egyptian society really developed this idea. Um, and so their religion is in some ways kind of optimistic. Um, and I want to I sort of get at the religion by saying, first of all, they had multiple gods and goddesses. Right? The Amon or Amon Re was the, was the sort of chief god, the head god in the Egyptian um, pantheon. Um, but they had an interesting story. And the, the story was that there were two gods, Osiris and Seth. 
and they were brothers. And Seth murdered Osiris and then cut up his body and spread it out all over the place so nobody would find it. But Osiris' wife, Isis, also a goddess, went and gathered together all the pieces of Osiris' body and, put, and tried to put him back together. And the other gods were so impressed by her devotion to her husband um, that they decided to give Osiris life again. Now, they couldn't just bring him back to life because he had been killed. So what they did instead is they made Osiris the god of the underworld, the god of the dead. And, and so Egypt has this new idea that's not there in Mesopotamia society, which is that you have this life after death, that you go somewhere else, right, to the land of the dead. And so Osiris is the god of the dead, of the underworld. And one of the interesting things that happens is that with this cycle of life, death, and rebirth, Osiris gets murdered again every year, but he gets, his, Isis puts his body back together again every year. So there's this endless cycle of life and death going on, even as the king of the dead. Um, but the most interesting thing about this is that, according to Egyptians, when you died, your soul came before Osiris. And what he would do is he would set up a scale, and he would put a feather on one side of the scale, and he would put your soul on the other side of the scale. And he would see which one was heavier. If, the, if your soul was lighter than a feather, it was without sin, and you'd lived a good life. And so you could go to the field of reeds, which was the Egyptian virgin of heaven. But if your soul was heavier than the feather, it was burdened with sin, then you couldn't go to the field of reeds. Right? Um, and so there's an afterlife. There's a judgment going on here. Right? But there's also an optimism. That death isn't you know, just an end of a long-suffering life. Death has the possibility of this field of reeds, this sort of version of heaven. Right? Um, the Egyptian pharaohs later in, in the Egyptian history took on, the, the, they tried to claim that they were, they were avatars of the god Horus, um, and, and they, they claimed sort of a godlike status. Um, So, um, so the Egyptian religion and government are more optimistic. Now, one of the outcomes of this, I mean, if anybody knows anything about ancient Egypt, they probably think of mummies. And, and the Egyptians did figure out the process of mummification. And, so, and, and this was very important for them religiously because the idea was that if you did manage to get to the field of reeds, you would want your body, <laughs> right? And so preserving the body allowed you to take it with you to the, to the next life. And in fact, it was thought that the wealthy thought that they, they would build a tomb for themselves when they were still alive. And then when they died, they'd be placed in the tomb with all the things that they thought they might want to take with them to the afterlife. And so the, the Egyptian tombs would often have, have um, you know, games or wine or food or, or all sorts of things that you might want to take, jewelry, knives, clothing, etc., that you would want to take to the afterlife. Now, here's where you also see how Egyptian society was really patriarchal in that often it was common to also place a dead Egyptian man's wife and slaves in the tomb with him and seal them up because he would need them in the afterlife. Now, of course, that meant that they died, uh, you know, a slow death probably from lack of water um, over, the, over, the, you know, over the days and weeks after the death of their uh, the male head of the household. Um, but, and so this both shows the sort of Egyptian society's patriarchy, that men were important enough that you would kill the women to send them along to the afterlife with them. Um, but it also shows a, a, a sort of an optimism in the religion in that the idea is that, we, that, that people could, their souls could go to a sort of heaven. Um, just like the Assyrians, uh, or I mean the Mesopotamian society, Egypt had a series of kingdoms. They had, they had, um, they had various smaller kingdoms um, before, uh, before um, 2600 BC. Uh, but in 2660 BCE, the, the, the entire valley of the uh, Nile in, in Egypt was, not, not the entire Nile River, that extends far into uh, Sudan, but the, the sort of lower Nile from the, there's a series of, waterfalls called cataracts. Um, and so from a particular cataract down to the Mediterranean is considered the lower Nile. So the entire lower Nile Valley was united in 2660 under a single uh, government um, called the Old Kingdom. And that would, that would persevere for, you know, 500 years, 
um, which, which both tells you how prosperous Egyptian society was, but also how isolated Egypt was. It's surrounded on three sides by desert and one side by ocean, so it's really hard to invade Egypt. The only place that really successfully invades Egypt in the ancient world is from people directly south of Egypt in Sudan on the Nile River Valley, um, because they can travel right up the Nile to get to Egypt. But otherwise, Egypt is really isolated. So it has a great deal of stability. So for 500 years, you have the Old Kingdom. Then you have the first intermediate period, which is a period where the, the unified government of Egypt breaks down. Right? Um, and the first intermediate period is from 2180 to 2080, so about 100 years. Um, uh, there's a period of sort of chaos there. And then um, a second, the Middle Kingdom, the so-called Middle Kingdom is established, and that would go for another 400 years from 2080 BCE to 1640 BCE. Um, and then there's another intermediate period. Okay. Um, and then finally you get the new, the new Kingdom, which is from 1570 to 1075 BCE. And at that point, an interesting thing happens. At that point, the government gets knocked off by external invaders called the Hyksos. Um, and we'll come back to the Hyksos when we're talking about the um, the Hebrew peoples, um, but for right now, what's interesting about the Hyksos is they brought horses and they brought bronze weapons, and that was their real technological advantage. Um, so the Hyksos would, would topple the New Kingdom uh, and, and would rule Egypt um, chaotically for, for about a century. Um, but that's basically it for, I mean, Egypt is, is notable because the, the, the kingdoms last longer than they did in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, there's more stability in Egypt. There's more productivity. The land is more fertile. The population is higher. It's, a, it's generally a more stable society than Mesopotamia was ever, ever able to produce.